Hello, everybody. I am Lorenzo Gianquintieri. I'm a PhD candidate from Politecnico di Milano. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here on the very last spot of this day of conference. <laughs> We are all a little bit tired, but I'll try not to bore you to death. Um, in some way, my presentation will be quite similar to the last speech because uh, um, I treat uh, health geomatics, in particular related to the public defibrillators. So let me, let me introduce the study. Uh, we're talking about health geomatics, which means the techniques of geomatics applied to data which are related to health and life science. This is no new thing. It, is, it has been done in uh, epidemiology for a long time, also to study the distribution and the diffusion of diseases, uh, or maybe the uh, environmental effect of pollution and other factors. But what I do is a little bit different uh, and is about uh, the data analysis related to emergency medical services. In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, uh, which is the complete cessation of uh, heart beating outside of a medical environment. Uh, as you can imagine, it is a very serious, uh, um, a very serious condition, highly life-threatening, and with a high risk of developing a permanent disability. Uh, the time for an effective intervention is strongly limited. Usually, it is considered to be six minutes. That's why. In the guidelines, it was developed the theory of the five bring up the chain of survival, uh, which are um, some guidelines to make the intervention as effective as possible that we, should, we all should know. And in particular, my topic is about uh, the early defibrillation, so how to reduce the time to the first defibrillation. The leading strategy to reduce the time for first defibrillation worldwide, uh, it is public access defibrillation which means the deployment on the territory of cities of publicly accessible automated external defibrillators, which are completely automated, so can be used even by a non-trained person. But the campaigns, obviously, uh, include uh, the training of lay rescuers on how to use the defibrillator and uh, some awareness raising in order to make people know that defibrillators are in the cities. Uh, my whole study is about a framework for the analysis, so uh, quality assessment and for uh, um, following optimization of the deployment of the defibrillators. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to talk, since we're talking about GIS, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the catchment area, which is actually the portion of territory which can be considered covered by the device. So, the area where the device can be used within the six minutes, that is uh, the time limit for the intervention. In the guidelines, uh, the limit is uh, a time, six minutes, how it is converted into a space limit. Unfortunately, there is no study in literature about this, uh, and also it is difficult because it depends on the usage model for the defibrillator. So will it be used by a bystander assisting to the arrest, uh, or will it be used by a first responder alerted by the EMS? It depends uh, on uh, how the EMS is organized uh, in different countries. Traditionally, the guidelines and the literature consider as the catchment areas a, a circular area with a 100 meter radius. But in more recent literature, there is a new approach, which is actually based on realistic catchment areas, which mean areas that are built considering the actual workable path along streets network. And obviously, this appears to be more suitable to represent a real world scenario. However, our hypothesis, which is driven from the preliminary analysis, uh, is that it's not always possible to compute the realistic catchment areas. So accordingly, we wanted to uh, compare those two mapping techniques uh, in order to identify situations where uh, it's more suitable to actually represent the realistic area, or where it's necessary to go back to the old approach and use a circular area. So let's go into the core of the study. Uh, first of all, the data that were used. Uh, our case study is on the territory of Lombardy region in Italy. Uh, the data are 
mostly open data, so basically open street map for the roads and the buildings. Uh, for the land use, uh, there is uh, DUSAF, which is a database provided by public administration in the region of Lombardia. Uh, and also we got a mapping of the defibrillators on the territory, which is provided by Azienda Regionale Emergenza Urgenza, that is the emergency medical services provider in Lombardia. And the total amount of device is 7,702. Unfortunately, as I said, not all data are open data because we have some medical data involved. So the database, uh, georeference database of the intervention related to a cardiac arrest out of hospital uh, is not open data because uh, it's considered to be medical and thus sensitive data. Uh, we considered the database from 2015 to the end of 2018 for a total of more than uh, 45,000 uh, arrests. The software use is basically QGIS and then PostgreSQL with the PG routing and PostGIS extension run on the OSGEO Live operative system. So, what catchment areas did we compute? First of all, the circular areas with 100 meters, which is the reference in literature, but also of 200 meters. Uh, the computation is pretty easy on QGIS, it's, uh, it's enough to run the buffer function, so this was not very complicated. A little bit more tricky is the computation of the realistic catchment areas, uh, which are computed actually on PostgreSQL. At least uh, when uh, this study was run, uh, actually right now uh, I implemented uh, a Python function, uh, which is uh, inside the QGIS environment in order to uh, be more direct uh, inside the environment. Uh, it was computed for uh, 7,500 uh, devices, 97% of the total, because uh, 58 devices were two distance from the streets, so it was not even, uh, it was not even possible to compute the, the, the realistic area. And uh, 141 were superimposed. This is quite common because uh, uh, the position of the defibrillators uh, is uh, geocoded. So we start from the address, uh, and obviously, in, uh, if in a single building there is more than one defibrillator, they will result to be in the same spot by coordinates. Again, the path, the measure for the path considered is 100 and 200 meters. So first, very straightforward data, the mean area. As you can see, the difference between the circular and the realistic approach when we consider the same dimensioning is significant. Uh, so they cannot be considered um, equivalent. But if you see, uh, the circular areas with 100 meters radius and the realistic areas with paths of 200 meters resulted to have quite a similar area. So therefore, we decided in the following of the analysis to consider these two uh, mapping uh, and to compare them statistically. What are catchment areas needed for? Basically, quality as assessment uh, means uh, how many arrests can we cover. That's why we need the georeference database of the arrests. As you can see, if we consider the circular areas, uh, we can cover 9.43% of the arrests, whereas with the realistic areas, we cover 15.35%. Despite, as we've seen, the mean area it's quite similar. So what we conclude is that the two function, even adjusting the dimensioning, uh, the two mapping techniques are not equivalent. So we have to uh, actually inspect more in detail and decide case by case which technique is more suitable. That's a little bit of a study of the error, the distribution. The error is considered to be the difference between the realistic area and the circular area. As you can see, it can be both an overestimation or an underestimation. So uh, it is very different. Realistic area are frequently undersides or even null because there are some computation fails in which the resulting area is zero. Uh, so we asked ourselves, is it possible to know in advance if uh, for a single device, for each single device, uh, it will be possible to compute the realistic error, or is it better to compute the circular one? To this aim, we computed some uh, attributes related to all the defibrillators. The first one is the distance, uh, intended to be the Euclidean distance between the device and the nearest street. Then we have the total length of the roads uh, in the area, the total number of road nodes, uh, the total area of the buildings, uh, 
And then two indicators that are custom indicators. One uh, is the urbanization index, which means how urbanized is the area, and the uniformity index, which is based on the land use provided by the DUSAF. So we got one attribute, then there's five indicators, which are computed on five different areas, spanning from 50 to 250 meters. So for a total of 25 attributes, plus the one that is the distance, we have a total of 26 attributes for each device. Um, a little statistical note, let me do it. Uh, outliers were removed uh, using the interquartile range. I'm not going to bother you with details. We can go back if uh, there are some statisticians interested and want to, uh, want to go in deep on this, but I will skip it. So the first approach is let's compute the linear correlation index between the area difference, again, realistic, minus circular, and all these attributes, considering the attributes not as formed, exponentially transformed, and logarithmic, uh, logarithmically transformed. Unfortunately, only two mild correlations were found with the distance and with the road length. But as you can see, the R is 0 0.6. So it means that only 36% of the variance uh, is explained, which cannot be considered as significant. So let's change approach. Uh, let's change approach. Uh, we try to identify all the failures which means all the cases in which the realistic area is uh, not represented the actual catchment area of the device, meaning that is undersized or even zero. How to identify it? We try to, um, to get a threshold value for the area. How do we do it? Below this threshold value, we must have at least nine out of 10 failures, whereas above this value, we must have uh, at max one out of 10 failures. So with this approach, we identify the threshold that is uh, uh, 12,500 meters square, and we obtain two different, uh, two different data sets, one of uh, 1,060 CS, that are the failures, and 6,429, which are the positives, meaning that the catchment address was computed correctly. Now that we have these two data sets, uh, we decided to run a statistical test, the Mount Whitney rank sum test. It is a non-parametric test because all the attributes resulted to be non-normally distributed. Uh, how does it work? We get these two data sets uh, with the null hypothesis that the two sets come from the same population. I run the test. If the result of the test is one, it means that the null hypothesis is rejected. And the two data sets come from different populations. Obviously, when I say rejected, uh, there is a confidence interval that is uh, uh, by default set to 95%. Whereas if the test result is zero, it means that the null hypothesis cannot be rejected and the two data sets may be from the same population. Maybe, but I don't know. So what I'm interested in is the one result where I can reject the null hypothesis. How is the setup for the test? I pick an attribute and I have the two sets, the sets of failures and the sets of positives. Unfortunately, the dimensions uh, are different, so I extract a random subset with the same dimension of the failures from the positives. So I have the two sets of uh, 1,067 values. Now I can run my test. I get a result that I save, and this part is repeated a thousand times on a thousand different subsets extracted from uh, the positives. Obviously. This whole process is repeated for all the 26 attributes. What results do we have? Uh, uh, 23 out of 27 attributes resulted to have 100% null hypothesis rejection, which means that on the base of these attributes, I can for sure distinguish between the two populations. And I can for sure say if it is, uh, is going to be a positive or a failure, which was our objective. So let's do some conclusion and let me recall a little bit the overall study rational. What do we want to do? We want to map the catchment areas of defibrillators, of public defibrillators, in order to run some quality assessment and to uh, subsequently optimize the distribution and the deployment. How do we want to do it? By realistic catchment areas. What is, what is the issue in uh, this approach? That is not always possible. With the manual threshold that we identified, we have almost 15% of failures, which is 
a significant amount. How to solve it? We proved that it's possible to preventively analyze the territory around the device in order to uh, identify it if it's possible to compute the realistic catchment error or for, or for uh, that device it is necessary to consider the circular one. And how to do it? What do I need? Basically, we can say that the main result of this study is that data from OpenStreetMap are all we need in order to make this kind of decision making. So there are some limits, uh, and all the limits can be overcome by future developments, but I think I will left uh, this if there are any questions. So for the moment, uh, thank you for your attention on this uh, last speech. So thank you very much for the presentation. Questions? Thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, my name is Akin from the UK. In the UK, we have um, a database, health database, and part of it, it shows um, the kind of diseases, um, different diseases, and I'm quite sure um, heart diseases um, linked to different areas is there. I don't know if you have something like that in Italy, and then you can use such information to know where the defibrillator can be placed um, because obviously there will be geographical representation of um, different diseases around the area. Yeah, that's, that's what I do, actually. That's exactly my project. Uh, this part uh, is what I presented because it's more related to the use of GIS. Uh, actually, I am a biomedical engineer and uh, my project is exactly what we were saying. So after this analysis, which tells me um, how the situation is. The following step is to, um, is to develop a risk map. A risk map in order to identify the areas where the risk of having an arrest is more, uh, is more stronger. And currently I do it with a little bit of a machine learning approach. So analyzing some attributes on a grading of the territory. So identify the area with the highest risk. And then if you cross the status quo, so how the distribution is with the demand and the potential risk, that's how you run the final optimization in order to uh, propose new deployment and new distribution of other defibrillators. Uh, actually, the medical data that we use are not from hospitals but are from the emergency medical services so from ambulances basically they are based on the report of the volunteers on ambulances I don't know if uh, you use data from hospitals or EMS too um, th there is a central um, place that um, a central organization which which is unique it it's worked directly with the Department of Health I mean the UK, so they are the one that decentralize um, um, fund into different hospitals. So because they they hold a lot of data from all the hospitals around the country, and um, they they've they've done some GIS works on it and distributes different diseases with different area. So it's it's easy. Yeah, yeah you you are more orga more organized than we are. <laughs> Lucky you. Thank you for presentation. Uh, do you have idea or what do you propose for the data that you are missing and that are not open? How you could collect if you have some clue? Unfortunately, it depends by the legislation because uh, right now um, they are as in the regional emergency agency, which is the MS provider, is the data collector and the data provider and they gave me the data. They have some specific legislation for research about this data, uh, but you know, um, sanitary system in Italy is a little bit of a mess. So uh, also this is the framework in Lombardy region. If you go to Veneto region or to Piemonte region, they have a different data policy. So unfortunately, there is no actual way to collect by citizen because it's medical data. So medical data are always considered sensitive data and they are treated with the specific legislation. Thank you. Other questions? We still have time? No, then. Yes. I'm just curious, I've been experimenting with a few different uh, ISO area algorithms 
and I haven't used that particular one from PostGIS yet. Do you know how it um, takes the network analysis and then transforms it into a polygon? And is it is your work sensitive to decisions involved in that? Yeah, it is. It is uh, actually in the first version uh, we were using alpha shapes, so um, the algorithm uh, basically creates the topology of the trees. Well. At the first step, there is an explosion of the streets. Uh, then we get the topology. We compute the path of the um, of the decided length. So we have the external points. And in the first version, uh, we were creating a polygon with uh, uh, alpha shapes. But uh, currently, I am using convex hull because uh, um, with the convex hull, you um, unify the external points, uh, the, the external points, uh, including also uh, the buildings. So the alpha shapes were just identifying the streets with a narrower shape, whereas the convex hull is an overall polygon. And this helps me because one of the parameters that I compute is uh, um, the population that lives inside the catchment area. So if I want to know the population, I have to include the buildings. And that's why I decided to swap to the convex hull. I don't know if answered to your question. That was it. So other questions? If not, I will conclude with a comment. If you can, can go back to the previous slide. I like very much because everything what you need is OpenStreetMap. So what this implies is that in Italy, in cities where the defibrillators are, then actually OpenStreetMap data has a very good quality. This is the implication there. So what you need is OpenStreetMap and PostGIS and you're done. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you also, all of you, for... Uh, taking part in the academic track, and see you all in about two and a half hours at the Galadinar event. Thank you. Thank you.